You know what? Throughout history, governments have established judicial systems, ways of trying to uphold justice in societies. Rules are put in place to ensure systems work smoothly. For instance, in the UK legal system, we assume an accused person is innocent until proven guilty. In fact, that principle has spread throughout most legal systems around the world. However, even the best systems sometimes fail, especially when corruption or selfishness creep in. This episode today will focus on the unjust and the illegal trial of Jesus, one of the greatest injustices in history, where the very system, not just the judicial and societal system, the very religious system failed where that which was meant to serve justice and the will of God and the society at that time failed to uphold even the most basic principles. Welcome to today's episode of the Bible Project Daily Podcast. Welcome indeed. This project is a plan to work through the entire Bible, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And you can join us midway through. Well, we're in the back end now, getting towards the back end of the Gospel of Mark, season six. And today we'll be covering Mark 14, verses 53 to 65. So you're very welcome, whether you're here for the first time or whether you've been here from the very beginning. And if you are a newbie, then please hang around at the end and I'll tell you about how things around here operate and I'll give you a few ways in which you can connect to this ministry and receive additional free Bible teaching and Bible study resources. So with that said, I'll say bye-bye for now and let's drop in and pick up where we left off in the text last time. Bye-bye for now. Throughout history, governments have established judicial systems, those that seek to see that justice is done in their particular society. In order to ensure the system works, they put rules in place. Overall, in the UK, I believe our system, although under great strain, still works fairly well, certainly from the legal point of view. But unfortunately, even the best systems don't always work right. Sometimes the very system that's meant to serve people lets people down. I'm sure we can all think of examples from our own countries around the world. But what can be extremely serious is when people working within the system themselves are corrupt. What then happens to the justice system? Can the system itself become unjust? And this is the background to what particularly happened to Jesus Christ when he was put on trial. Let's be clear about this. The trial of Jesus Christ that we're looking at today wasn't just unjust, but it was illegal by the standards of their day. What I'd like us to do today is look at that trial and remember that this is played out specifically and particularly on a spiritual plane. And what I hope we can learn from this are spiritual lessons, not primarily political lessons. As a matter of fact, I think one of the greatest spiritual lessons you can learn in life is found in this passage. I believe that if you don't get hold of this principle of justice from a spiritual point of view, then you might experience some real feelings of grief and injustice in your life and struggle to respond to it when it appears. The passage today will begin by giving us a description of some of the court proceedings in general that surrounded Jesus and the particular problem that they faced when they attempted to build their case against him. Then in the middle of the passage we see the actual prosecution of the Lord and then finally we hear a verdict is given. So with that in mind let's look together at this passage and we're going to work through verse by verse from verse 53 to 65. I'll try and unpack it as we go along, which is our usual practice here on the Bible Project Daily Podcast. And then I'll try and pull it all together and see what it really means for us today and how we might apply it in our lives. So the text begins for us today in Mark chapter 14, verse 53, which says, They took Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests, the elders, and the teachers of the law came together. 
Now let me clarify at this point because it helps if we back out of Mark for a minute and consider the other four Gospel accounts of these events. If we take information from across all four Gospel accounts, we will quickly see that there's not just one trial of the Lord going on here, but there are in fact six occasions in total where Jesus, if you like, is cross-examined. So in a sense, he's put on trial several times, six times in fact. So let me give you a quick overview of the six trials that Jesus will face, the six tests, the six cross-examinations. The first three are going to be Jewish, and the last three are Roman in basis. The first of these trials occurs when they take him to Annas, and that is described for us primarily in John's account in chapter 18. Now, Annas was a high priest, and according to the Old Testament, a high priest was someone who was appointed for life. But things were different in Jesus' day and age. You see, when the Romans took over, they displaced this guy Annas and they put in place Caphias, who was his son-in-law. So at this point, Caphias is the high priest. Now the Romans recognised Caphias and saw Annas as an irrelevance, yesterday's man, so to speak. So although both were functioning of a manner, as sort of high priest, neither had complete authority across both societal groups. So after his cross-examination before Annas, then Jesus is brought before the whole Sanhedrin, which we will later see in Mark's account when we get into chapter 15. So you see, there are three Jewish trials, Annas, Caphias, and then the Sanhedrin. Then the Roman trials begin, and that's when we see him sent to this guy called Pilate. And at the first meeting, Pilate wants to have nothing to do with him. So after a few questions, Pilate sends him to Herod. Herod, we then see cross-examine him, and he doesn't want to have anything to do with the situation either. So he sends him back to Pilate again, who questions him once again. So those are the three Roman trials, Pilate, then on to Herod, and then finally back to Pilate again. So the point that we've arrived in the overall story, we've now arrived at in Mark chapter 14, is the Lord standing facing Caiaphas and his trial, his cross-examination with him. Now this is the first trial actually recorded in Mark's account, but it is in fact the second of the six he's going to face when we consider and look across all the gospel accounts. So let's pick it up. Next verse, Mark 14, 54. Peter followed on at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. There he sat with the guards and warmed himself at the fire. So this opens with a sort of pre-trial involving Caiaphas before, the second of those, before he goes, before his main Jewish trial, where he will have to stand and face the whole Sanhedrin. So that's the background to what's going on here. But there's something else that's helpful to know about this setting in the background and the setting of this in that the Sanhedrin had a problem and that problem was huge. If we back up for a minute and think of what we looked at a couple of days ago, in verse 1 it tells it told us specifically what that problem was. It told us now the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread were only two days away and the chief priests and the teachers of the law who would of course make up this part of the Sanhedrin to a great extent, they were scheming to arrest Jesus and secretly kills him. So this shows that right before they even start this cross-examination, this is a corrupt trial already. They had already in a sense reached a verdict. What they were doing was plotting to kill him and they wanted to justify that. So in other words, the principle of innocent Till proven guilty certainly didn't exist here but they still needed to sow some some semblance of a trial uh, which needed to be witnessed you see according to Jewish law in order for someone to be condemned for a capital offense like this there had in fact to be at least two witnesses and those two witnesses had to agree however verse 55 to 57 tells us this The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against against Jesus so they could put him to death, but they could not find any. Many testified, but falsely against him, and their statements did not agree. Then some stood up and gave open false testimony against him. So in their search for two independent witnesses to testify against him, they couldn't find any. So they called forward these deliberately false witnesses. But when they made their statements, they couldn't get them to agree. And that's the problem they faced. 
They could always find people and drag up people who were willing to speak out against him. But what they could not do was to get them all to agree and say the same thing and witness as testimonies for each other. So they had a problem. And because of that problem, they found they couldn't persecute a case that might involve the death penalty under their own Jewish law. Renowned Scottish Bible professor William Barclay, professor of New Testament Greek at Glasgow University for many years, tells us that the Jewish law, in fact, required three witnesses. Firstly, that what was called a vain witness, who would stand and give evidence. Secondly, a standing witness who would come and collaborate. The first witness would have witnessed the original offence. And then finally, a third witness, which was called an equal witness, whereby another separate witness would come and give testimony to another separate but similar offence, thus proving a pattern of behaviour and not just a one-off misinterpretation of what was said. And this is what was meant to happen here. The original event witnessed by someone and then two witnesses to independently back it up and that it didn't occur just once. And what the Sanhedrin are doing here, they're trying, they're unable to do that naturally, so they're trying to pull that whole thing together by using cross witnesses. But they can't get the statements to all agree. But let's pause for a moment and hear what some of those false witnesses actually says, because it tells us in verse 58, We heard him say, I will destroy the temple, made with human hands, and in three days we'll build another, not made with hands. Now, is that true? Is that what Jesus actually said? We have an account of it earlier in the Gospel. Did he say, I will destroy this temple? Well, no, that's not what he said. Not even close. It sounds a little bit like it, but it's not what he said. What he said, we looked at in some detail a couple of uh, weeks ago, when Jesus cleared the temple area of the money changers. I don't know if you remember, it was way back recorded in John chapter 2, beginning at verse 19. Probably over a month ago now, thinking about it. Well, what Jesus actually said was, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it up again in three days. Then he replied, It has taken 40 years to build this temple, but you are going to raise it in three days. But the temple he had spoken of was his body. So they are saying he said he could destroy the temple, but he didn't say that. In fact, he said if the temple were destroyed, he would raise it up in three days. And then he even clarifies by saying that it was a metaphor, an allegory he was using, because he said the temple he was speaking of was the temple of his body. So these are false witnesses twisting what he said to say that he would destroy that physical temple. But verse 58 in Mark 14 and 59 also tell us, yet even their testimonies did not agree. So false witnesses, yes, but when they called them forward, they said false things about him and they could not even get those things to agree with each other. So that's the problem facing this court. How do you convict someone of a capital offence deserving of death if you don't have witnesses? So the high priest steps up and he's the one who will be the prosecutor of any potential case. Let's hear what he says and does in 60 and 61. The high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. So now we see that Jesus' response to the false accusations was, is, a, is a lack of response, no response. So now that takes an explanation, doesn't it? So what's going on here? Well, helpfully, Matthew's account throws some light on this matter for us. Matthew 26, when recording the same situation, says this, Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent. The high priest then said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. So the high priest in Matthew's account is seen to put Jesus now under an oath, and that was illegal. Under Jewish law, you could not put someone under oath and ask them to testify against themselves. And that principle still applies in many legal systems today. They couldn't, by their own rules, do that, yet that's what the high priest is doing here. What the high priest wants to do is to get Jesus to incriminate himself. 
So why did Jesus say nothing? He could have said they did not have correct witnesses testify against him. He could have said he was not guilty of saying what he said, but instead he simply remained silent. And the reason he did this was because he was fulfilling prophecy. He is bringing to pass exactly what the Old Testament said would happen concerning the Messiah and how he would respond in such circumstances. Isaiah 53 verse 7 tells us that the Messiah was oppressed and afflicted, yet did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before the shearers is silent, he did not open his mouth. So Jesus just says nothing, just as predicted. And then verse 61 of Mark tells us, again the high priest asked him, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? So Caiaphas is saying to him, all right, speak up. I've now put you under oath and I'm asking you the question, are you the Messiah? So remember, he remains silent when the false charges are brought against him. But when asked under oath, if he's actually the Messiah, a straightforward question, Jesus said, I am, said Jesus, and you will see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of the Mighty One coming on the clouds of heaven. Now we need to note that what Jesus said was, I am. So do not let anyone tell you that Jesus himself never claimed to be the Son of God. Here it is as plain as day. Not only does he say, I am, but his use of the phrase, I am, echoes the very name of God, that God used of himself when he revealed himself, remember, to Moses at the burning bush. He then goes on to tell him that not only is he the Messiah, the the Son of God, but that one day they will see him sitting on the right hand of God and returning from heaven in great power and glory to set up the kingdom, just as spoken of in in prophecy in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, in fact. They would have known and been familiar with these scriptures. So here we're at the critical moment in the trial. He's asked the question under oath, the specific plain question, are you the Messiah? Are you the son of the God most high? And Jesus replies, I am. If Jesus had said no to that question, well, in effect, the trial would have been over and he probably would have walked out a free man and could have escaped the cross. But he replies when asked, are you the Messiah, the son of God? I am. And by doing so, He's actually signed his own death warrant. He well knew what he had done, so now we hear the verdict. Mark 14, 63 and 64. The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any to hear any more witnesses, he asked. You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they all condemned him as worthy of death. They all condemn him to death, friends. Now, of course, all of this, everything you've heard, should have been illegal. But what makes it worse is, well, listen to what what verse 65 says. Then some began to spit at him, and they blindfolded him, struck him with their fists, and said, Prophesy. And the guards, now that's the officers of the religious court, not Roman military guards at this point. They took him, and they beat him. So this is incredible. This is meant to be a justice system being expressed. And what are they doing? They're spitting on him. And the very officers of the court are the ones doing it. And even the high priest himself. Imagine being cross-examined in court and the judge coming down from the chair and spitting on you. And the guards employed to ensure good order in the court begin to hit you as well. And then the jury climb out of the jury box and come and slap you around a bit. Well, that's what's going on here. Just how unjust is this? But that, my friends, is what is going on here. This meeting, this coming together as a cross-examination may have become just as a sham portrayal of a pretend justice system, but in the end, all the pretense is gone. It ends up in a frenzied display of hatred without even an attempt to maintain a veneer of impartial injustice. This trial was illegal, immoral and unjust from the beginning to the end. And what I believe this passage is telling us as an end result of this illegal trial, Jesus we see is condemned precisely because he said yes when he was asked if he was the Messiah. Okay, that's the passage. Let me try and sum this up for you with a few simple points. Yes, the proceedings that Jesus faced here on this day were totally illegal. 
but more so perhaps than you might even imagine. Let me try and break it down a little bit on the, the laws that were violated by the religious leaders on this day. Firstly, for the Sanhedrin's decision to be valid, the Sanhedrin had to meet in its own court area. But they did not do this. We know from the text they met in Caphaeus's house. Secondly, all criminal cases must be completed during the daytime. And again, that was not the case. They met at night, so again they broke their own rules of justice. Thirdly, criminal cases could specifically not be tried during the Passover, and the opening verse tells us that the trial was indeed conducted during the Passover. And this, finally, if the verdict was guilty, then a night must always pass before the announcement of any sentence, so that what they described or described as any feelings of mercy or justice might have time to arise and how they re should respond. But they did not do either, well, any of these, as a matter of fact. These were the very own rules of the Sanhedrin, but in their eagerness to destroy Jesus, they broke all their own rules and more. Okay, friends, that's the text. But I believe there's an important lesson from this when extrapolated out of the plain narrative of the events. And that is this. There is no perfect justice in this life. And the, even the life of our Saviour Jesus Christ is an illustration of that fact. There is no perfect justice in the world, financially, politically, socially, and sometimes even judicially. Even in our own British judicial system, which I do believe is one of the best in the world, injustices still happen and go on, on a daily basis in fact. So surely the question we should actually ask is, what should we do when injustice happens? What should we do when it happens to us or when we see it happen to others? I wonder if you've ever been treated unjustly. Well, if that's the case and it happens to you, it's happening to you or it happens to you in the future, what should we do when we experience injustice? Now, I think it's rather interesting that Peter is on the sidelines of all this, witnessing what's going on. He's standing on the side, actually warming himself by the fire. So he witnesses all of this. I wonder how he reacted. Well, we can know how he reacted in the long term because later Peter wrote a letter some years later, in fact, and in it he gives us an insight to what he learned that night and what we might learn from it today. And what he said was this. When he wrote this, he's talking to believing Christians, people who are being forced to submit to undeserved, unjust ill-treatment from their masters, and this is what he says. Slaves, he writes, in reverent fear of God, submit yourself to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for good and endure it, that then is commendable before God. So when justice strikes, well, if the system doesn't allow you to do anything about it, and there's no recourse, then I believe what Peter is saying, we just need to be patient. Now that may seem hard, that may seem impossible for us at times, and that is why he also says that it will in fact take the grace of God to do it. So that is who we should lean on. He continues in 2 Peter 2.21, To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. So he's saying here, if you want to know how to handle injustice, well, Jesus is the greatest example. Jesus is the ultimate example. He's the archetype, so to speak, of the worst possible things happening to the best possible person. Jesus is that example. And believers are also to submit, to acknowledge that there will be undeserved suffering in our lives because it happened to him and he can be our example. So that does not mean that you should necessarily defend yourself or wield the sword against it, but it does say that you should not get angry, bitter, or retaliate with the same like. Peter goes on to say, and I believe this is the lesson we need to learn for us, 1 Peter 2, 22-24, He committed no sin, 
and no deceit was found in his mouth. And when they are hurled insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who will judge justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. For by his wounds you have been healed. Now remember, Peter personally witnessed the trial of Christ. He witnessed him unjustly committed, tried and executed. And in all of this, he said Jesus did not retaliate. Jesus suffered visual, verbal abuse and painful torture. He was mocked and forced to carry his own cross and crucified to death. Yet through it all, he never got angry or insulted anyone or threatened to get even. He did not even attempt to verbally convict those who were using and committing legal errors against him. Here's what Jesus did, and this is important, because he did respond, but here's what the lesson is for us. He just committed himself to the one that will judge justly. He handed over the judgment of sinners to God, whilst at the same time, of course for him, it would mean handing himself to death, to die for the sins of mankind, so that we might have the opportunity to be forgiven and live and experience a righteous life. If we are made righteous in Christ, then we can leave the injustices of the world in the hands of the only one who is ultimately able to judge sinners and the guilty. Hear me and hear me well, friends. Injustice is a fact of life. But when you're entreated justly, don't curse the situation. Don't even curse the accuser, if there is one, because you don't have the authority to do that. Just appeal to the highest court of all, the one and only God who is able to judge all things, and then leave it in his hands. Listen again to what he said. When they heard insults at him, he did not retaliate. When they suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. There's no perfect justice in the world. Injustice exists in financial, political and societal, evil and legal realms. And Jesus, we see him facing the epitome of injustice. He did not retaliate, but committed himself to God, the ultimate God, through his sacrifice on the cross. He bore our sins and offered us forgiveness. When asked a straight question, he gave a straight answer, but he did not attack he left the judgment to God. Injustice is a harsh reality of life for us all, but we can find solace in knowing that we can appeal to the highest court of all and that God is the one who will ultimately judge justly. So when you feel you're facing injustice, let us remember Jesus' example to entrust ourselves and our cause to the one who can and will ultimately bring true justice into our lives and the lives of everyone and even those who stand against us. We probably all know people who failed at one thing or another. Some people fail in their jobs, they fail in businesses they start, Sadly, for some, they even fail in their marriage. And these unfortunate experiences happen to all sorts of people, Christians and non-Christians alike. But spiritual failure is the most serious type of failure for the Christian believer. Because a failure in your Christian life, it doesn't mean you don't have the potential to be forgiven, but it does mean that there can be an ever-widening distance between you and God. And it can even lead to a possible slipping into sin. I hope that's not a shock for you. But, spoiler alert, the truth is Christians do sin. In fact, people who know the Lord a long time sometimes even slip and fall. Even Christian leaders, sadly, we see, sometimes fall big time, right in the glare of public publicity. So what is your response to that? What is our response to that? Well, I hope it's not to sit back and be smug when we see someone else fall or a high-profile Christian fall and say, tut, tut, that would never happen to me. You might even have a judgmental attitude about them because there is, in fact, something we can learn from the failure of others. Today, I'd like us to talk about one of the classic cases of failure seen for us in the Bible. 
However, I also hopefully want us to learn something from this particular example of a profound spiritual failure. This is a very famous story. People who know very little about the Bible still seem to know something about the basic facts that this guy called Peter, perceived as one of the leaders, if not the leaders, of the disciples, at one point denied he even knew the Lord. And he did it three times. So what I want us to do this morning is look at this passage, walk through it together, but then at the end of that process, go beyond the text and look what I think the deeply significant message it's trying to teach us, the profound truth that it offers us. This passage on the surface is a straightforward recording for us of events that took place around the situation that caused Peter to deny the Lord three times. We will see that in the first one, he's in the courtyard of the high priest Cephas. This is where Jesus is being cross-examined in this sort of unjust quasi-trial that we looked at yesterday. Now, I would say as an aside, the very fact that he's been there, we should give him some credit. Because remember, we found out yesterday, just a few verses back, that all the others had forsook him and fled. So before we get too hard on Peter, please recognize that he had at least come back. He was still hanging around, albeit on the edge of events, watching what was unfolding before him. And just by being there, he was, of course, putting himself potentially in harm's way. So let's see what the text tells us, and let's begin our working through it together, which is the normal pattern. I'll go through it verse by verse and then try and apply what it means, the true, profound truth it gives us and the application of it in our lives. So picking up the text in Mark 14, and the first two verses, 66 and 67, say this. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him and said, You were with the Nazarene Jesus. Now, the fact that she refers to Jesus as the Nazarene, Jesus of Nazareth, the Bible experts say the tone being used here is judgmental. And that's because Nazareth was seen as a little backwater town, and people from there didn't get much respect. Well, let's see how Peter responded to this. Peter denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said, and he went out into the entrance. Now, the other gospel accounts tell us that at this point a cock crowed. Peter here is seen to say, I don't know what you're talking about. I've never even heard of him. Now, you may remember yesterday we heard how early in the text Jesus had already predicted that before the cock crowed twice, Peter would deny himself three times. So verse 68 is the Peter's first denial of Jesus. So that verse 68 I've just read is the very first denial of Peter. And from there he leaves the courtyard and he goes, it says, to the entrance, which means he goes and stands in the porch by the front of the courtyard. And this we see is Peter's first failure. In fact, this is a climax of a series of failures, really, that Peter has had in this last week of Jesus' life. You'll remember at the beginning of the chapter, which we looked at a few days ago, when Jesus first predicted that this very thing would happen, Peter vehemently denied it. He literally said to Jesus, I would die first before I would do such a thing. He even dared to compare himself to the other disciples and said, well, they might feel in that way, but I won't. Another factor we covered a few days ago is that he didn't pray when he was told to when he was told to watch and pray so that he wouldn't fall into temptation. And we find him do, well, he had one job, which was to stay awake, and rather than do that, he had a nap. Remember, it's that story a few days ago when they all went into the Garden of Gethsemane, and Jesus said to him, you should go and pray so that you do not succumb to temptation. Jesus didn't say, go and pray for me. He said, go and pray for yourself in order that you don't fall into the temptations that you're going to face soon. But Peter, with the others granted, they went off and they fell asleep. And then here we see when he's actually confronted with a temptation, he lies. And he says, I don't even know what you're talking about. I don't even know this man. Now, in the context of Peter's life, yes, this is a moment of profound failure. But please note, his failures do not mean that he does not have a future as a believer and a follower of Jesus. 
There is a huge difference between failing and being a failure. And that's the lesson we need to learn here. Making a mistake does not necessarily mean that you are a failure without a future. Failure as a Christian believer is not final. It never needs to be a final defining characteristic. The text continues. When the servant girl saw him there, remember he's standing in the porchway area now, she said again and to those standing around, this fellow is one of them. So the first time she spoke directly to Peter, but this second time she speaks to the whole group of people who are gathered there. So what will Peter do now? Verse 69. Again he denied it. And after a little while, those standing near to him said, Surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. Now it would seem that his accent gave him away. By the way, the contemporary historians from that period tell us that the Galileans had a very strong rural accent. So much so that they were actually forbidden for saying any of the benedictions or prayers in the main synagogue. But be that as it may, we can see that one failure often leads to another. We can see that in our everyday life, can't we, when one lie never tends to stand alone. Because often, if we tell a lie, then we find ourselves having to back up that lie with other lies to cover our tracks, so to speak. And thus, prolonging and widening the deception. But the thing I want to point out here, I need to point out here, is no matter who you are or how long you've been walking with the Lord, you can still have the potential to fail and fail big time, just like Peter does here. We Christians are not perfect. We're just forgiven. Never forget, even if you love the Lord and you've been forgiven and handed your life over to him, never forget that at heart you still have a sinful nature and you can and still will make mistakes and fail spiritually and even perhaps morally. But as long as we have breath in our body, we still have the possibility not only of going back to our old ways, but also, thankfully, the gift of receiving forgiveness. You see, this gift of forgiveness and eternal life does not guarantee that you won't make mistakes, that you won't even fail or fall down in the future. The most fascinating thing about this story, I think, is that Peter was so convinced previously that he wouldn't do this sort of thing. I'll die first, he said. A loud affirmation which tells me that the loudest of affirmations in what you believe will still not guarantee faithfulness into the future. I have to be frank with you friends. I sometimes think the louder people declare these sort of things, I often think secretly underneath they're really just trying to convince themselves. You see the truth of the matter is we must acknowledge because of our sinful nature we are all capable of falling. We're all capable of getting into serious moral entanglements. If not, you underestimate the power of sin. And as a matter of fact, Peter here demonstrates for us, well, that it can happen, but he also demonstrates clearly that determination not to do it is not the key thing. Maybe you have done something in the past and you are determined not to do it again. And again, you think because you're determined, that's going to help you not do that again. Well, I would say, have your New Year resolutions taught you nothing? Determination does not determine success. And this one great illustration of the Bible is Peter. It is something else that determines success in the victory over sin and temptation. Nobody was more determined than Peter here. So the issue is not deciding. The issue is not your determination. The issue of victory over sin and temptation is dependency. Do you remember the apostles, what Paul said in his second letter to the Corinthian church? He reminded them that when I am weak, I am strong. You see, it is your dependence on the Lord that will make and keep you strong, not your determination. That's why the Lord, through the Holy Spirit, in the very same chapter, told Paul, reminded Paul to tell them that my grace is sufficient for you. It's not the determination of the human will. It never has been. It's our dependence on divine grace that keeps us from making mistakes and even falling away into sinful practices. What Peter should have done was depend upon the grace of God to get him over that situation before the cock had crowed even the first time. We too, when confronted with temptations, should immediately pray 
pray and remove ourselves from the situation and thereafter rely totally on the Lord. Having said that, let me say that that doesn't mean that there won't be occasions where we won't fail. But failing does not mean that you're a failure who has no future. Let's pick up again in the main text, 14 verse 71. He began to call down curses and swore to them. So this is Peter here. I don't know this man you're talking about, he said. Now you'll notice there's been a progression here in the accusations and the stakes are getting bigger and bigger for him all the time as more and more people are drawn into what's occurring and hearing, well, this lie. His denials are getting larger and louder to the point that he's now swearing an oath, swearing that he doesn't know what they're talking about. Now, most commentators agree that the swearing mentioned here means he's saying something like, May God judge me if this is not true. I swear before God I don't know what you're talking about. That's the sort of thing. So he's doing that, and then this happens. Immediately the cock crowed the second time. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken. Before the cock crows twice, you will disown me three times. And there he broke down and wept. The Lord had said you are going to do this. You're going to deny me three times, he said. And I started out today by saying that I wanted to look at this passage, but I also want to go beyond it and try and figure out, consider what it really means. Let me read to you an extra couple of verses that appear in Luke's account of these events that isn't isn't actually mentioned in Mark. Luke 22, halfway through verse 60 to 62, tells us, Immediately, while he was speaking, the rooster crowed, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the words of the Lord and how he said to him, Before the rooster crows three times, you will deny me. So Peter went out and wept bitterly. One little extra phrase, but I think it's an important one. Jesus didn't actually say a word. He just looked, looked at Peter, and Peter knew. What a powerful moment that must have been for Peter. I'm so glad it was recorded for us by Luke. Now, this is not a look of anger. It's a look of quiet acceptance. This is not a look of bitterness upon Peter. It's a look of compassion. It's not a look of a guilty accusation. What I see in this text is a look of divine grace. I don't see any hostility. I just see a look of sadness combined with an acknowledgement of the reality, but also combined with forgiveness. It seems to me as though Jesus looked and said, I'm saddened, but I want you to know that although you feel today, it doesn't mean you're a failure. So having seen this, having done this, having seen Jesus do this, the text then tells us that Peter went out and not surprisingly he wept bitterly. However, friends, even though Peter denied him three times, the look of the Lord at one and the same time, yes, it convicted him, but I believe it also forgave him. And because the repentance is there, we see it, don't we? The text tells us he wept. I believe at that point he got it. And because he got it, he wept. But because he got it, he got forgiven. And his failures did not define him. And as a failure, personally, his falling into sin, his falling again into sin, means yes, he failed, but it did not mean that he would live his life as a failure. And what that tells me, and what it should tell you, is that if you fail, if you fall, you too are definitely not defined by that, and you are not without a future in the service of the Lord. Okay, let me try and sum this up by making a couple of observations. You know, the New Testament was written over a period of about 40 years. It was actually started, probably the first book written was a book called James, written about 20 years after Jesus' death, and it ended with the book of Revelation, which was written sometimes between 75 and 95 AD, so around 40 to 60 years after the death of the Lord. Now, we also have some contemporary writings written alongside the Bible text, Now, these aren't scriptures, but they're helpful in backing up and giving confirmation of some of the stuff within the main Bible text. One of these such writings was by a man named Patnos, P-A-T-N-O-S, 
who is believed to have written something between maybe as early as 95 AD or, or up to 110. And we know this because his writing he talks about relating to and knowing Philip's daughter. So we know he's very close to the writings at the same time, maybe as close to being about the time as the book of Revelation or five or ten years later. So writing at a similar time as the later books of the New Testament are being written. This guy Patnos says that to a great extent the Gospel of Mark, which we're looking at together, was actually Peter's preaching material transcribed by Mark. He claimed that Mark, going around, was witnessing events and listening and wrote down a great detail of not only what Jesus said and did, but also what Peter said about what happened and his account of things. And he said much of that is recorded in Mark's Gospel account. Now I'm not alone in thinking that, and modern historians aren't alone in, in approaching Mark in this way. Three other very early fathers of the Christian faith also held this view. People, you may have heard of them, a guy called Tertullian of Carthage, Clement of Alexander, and another early theologian called Irenaeus. Now, if they're correct, and Mark was in fact recording what Peter said, then this is important to understand that here, these events we're looking at, what we have here is Peter himself, through his own testimony, publicly admitting to his failure. Now, another observation worth taking account of is the fact that the Gospel of Mark was written to Christians who were living in Rome at that time. And at that time, Christians were facing similar things to what Peter was facing here. They were going through the beginnings of what would become a full-blown persecution, which means they were being challenged to deny the Lord all the time. So how helpful these writings must have been for them to see that Peter the person who was acknowledged as an apostolic leader, that Peter himself failed. Peter acknowledges that he fails. He acknowledged as here in this narrative that he fell well below the standards that the Lord had set for him. And he fails and he falls away. And indeed, by denying the Lord, he sinned. And let me just go one step further. He didn't just commit an everyday sin. He committed an enormous sin, didn't he? Because he knew the Lord personally, yet he still denied the Lord and did it three times. He didn't just tell a lie. His lie involved him denying his Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, three times face to face. Now, don't get me wrong. We know there's no hierarchy of sins. All sins are equal sins before Lord and all can be forgiven. But some sins definitely have more serious consequences than others. But here we see Jesus' right-hand man, one of his key representatives on earth, and who will continue to be that, is the guy himself who denies him three times. Now you too may have sin in your life. They could be very serious sins, not in the hierarchy, but in the sense that they have a profound effect on you or other people. Sins like having an affair, stealing, lying, addiction, being addicted to drugs, alcohol, or even pornography. Now, some people love to put sins in a hierarchy, but as Christian believers, we don't think that way. We recognize that sins have different levels of catastrophic effects on the believer or those around them, but we also believe that anyone who commits any sin can be forgiven, restored, even asked, expected to serve in the body of Christ again. That is the definite truth. So please hear this because this, I think, is the greatest lesson of this passage. In that as Christians, we know the Lord, yet we can still make mistakes and fall back into sin. We can fail and we can fail big time. But the lesson taught here is always that God forgives and God restores and God does that big time as well. The Lord forgives sinners, the Lord restores sinners, but most importantly, the Lord also uses restored sinners. The Lord restored Peter here, and very soon, a few months later, we see him win 3,000 souls to Christ. Bible experts would say less than two months after these events. 
Peter denied the Lord Jesus just one day before he was crucified. Then 50 days later at Pentecost, God used him to establish the church through the preaching of the good news of the gospel. So remember this. I've said it many times before. Salvation is a free gift. Trust in him and you are forgiven of your sins, past, present and future. But that future phrase means you may still sin. But the truth is that if you fall into sin, you can always fall also on your spiritual knees and cry out in sorrow and he will forgive you. He will restore you. In fact, he will sanctify you, make you clean and use you again because God is in the forgiving business. You know what, friends, I've failed many times in my life, daily in fact, but sometimes I've failed profoundly as well. But by the grace of God, I know I'm not defined by my failures. Maybe when I do fail, I'm more inclined to reach out and try and grasp hold of God's grace. Maybe I might still learn something when I fail and get things wrong in the knowledge that God does not abandon me and he wants to reveal to me how he has a better plan for my life, a better plan that I'm currently following. And that is what I believe the Lord would teach all of us listening to this and approaching this passage today. He says, I don't want you to fail, but know this, that when you do, I will tell you what I told Peter. Failing does not mean that you are a failure. It just means you need to come back to me and let me forgive you and restore you. Okay, friends, that's it for today. I do hope you find that helpful and encouraging. You know, this episode today, it wasn't just a historical narrative. It was a message of hope and restoration. Peter, despite his monumental failure, went on to become a key figure in spreading the message of Christ and in fact, establishing the early church. As we explore this passage together, and as perhaps you meditate on it, let its implications remind you that in moments of failure, God's grace is sufficient. We are, none of us are defined by our mistakes as Christians. We are defined by our response to them and our willingness to seek forgiveness and restoration by turning back to him. So stay with us, friends, and stay joined with us as we journey and continue this journey together through the Gospel of Mark as we uncover the profound truths, like we've discovered today that failing does not make us failures, it just makes us human, human beings in need of grace and to remaining open to the transformative power of the love of God. So thank you for joining us in this episode today and stay tuned for more, I hope, what will be enriching discussions and explorations through the first gospel ever written. And if you've enjoyed today's episode, please consider subscribing wherever you get your podcasts from and leaving a review. That way you can make the decision to make the study of the Bible part of the rhythm of your daily life. And your support and your subscriptions, they really help do that. And your reviews and your shares, all those things, they help reach us reach more listeners with this timeless message of faith and hope. So don't forget to connect. Visit the Bible Project host page where you'll find all the links to all the places that you can connect and support this ministry. With that all said, I'll say bye-bye for today and I do hope I'll see you back here tomorrow or whatever day works for you as we work together through this Bible Project daily podcast. Bye-bye for now.